Welcome back to another episode of the Brett Snodgrass Podcast, and this is where we talk about success, freedom, and purpose. Make sure you check out all of our videos on the Brett Snodgrass channel on YouTube, and make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you get all the videos each and every week. Today, I've got one of my best friends on the show with me, Mr. Brian Snyder, uh, CEO of Simple Wholesaling, and Brian I've known uh, for many years now, and I'm really excited to have Brian on the show. Uh, Brian, I'm going to kind of give your highlight reel. So number one, so Brian Snyder is one of my best friends in the world. I don't know if I tell you that all the time, but man, you're just a, an amazing friend to me. Uh, Brian is the CEO of Simple Wholesaling, which is a company that I currently own. So if you don't know that, uh, I own Simple Wholesaling. Um, Brian graduated with a bachelor's degree in middle school education. And he was a teacher for 14 years before he moved from the stinky state of Ohio <laughs> to the Hoosier state of Indiana, uh, where he met his lovely wife, Anna. And uh, then I've known Brian for many years, like I've said. And uh, we talked a few years ago, and he became a team member of the Simple Whole Wholesaling Organization. And he's done an amazing job. So now, three and a half years later, he is the CEO. And he's done just a darn good job um, it, because in 2020, we had our record year, best year ever in the 13 years I've been doing this business. Uh, Brian, I believe that you've been a part of, I counted, about 840 deals. So I think you've sold or helped sell when he became Dispo Manager, uh, helped sell 840 properties. And uh, you've really stepped into your God's given gift of leadership. So Welcome to the show, Brian Snyder. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, man. So it's uh, it's, it's kind of funny when we get to do stuff like this because it's so different than the way we usually interact. So <laughs> no, I'm excited, man. Thanks for having me on. No, uh, it's um, no, it's my my pleasure, and uh, thank you so much for just taking the time out. I know you're a busy man, and uh, and I really a lot of times when we have interviews like this and we talk, we talk about just kind of the business, what we're doing, our goals, our vision. And we talk about, um, you know, just to kind of what we're going to do for the next year. And today I really want to talk about you and your life. And I want to, to dig in to who is Brian Snyder. So with that being said, let's just take us back, man. You grew up, born, I believe, in Ohio. And what was, what was Brian Snyder like as a kid? What was your family like? What were you into? Take us into that. Yeah, man, I'm just a I'm just a farm boy from uh, Southeast Ohio. So grew up like kind of right on that, you know, the Appalachia border, really. So, you know, we kind of grew up in an area, a lot of farmland, um, but then also just a lot of uh, socioeconomic, like, you know, just kind of it, it was low socioeconomic um, area where I'm from um, still is and stuff. Um, but yeah, man, I, I'm a farm boy, grew up uh, baling hay and cutting grass in the summertime and doing all that kind of stuff, work on the farm a little bit for my grandparents, and that's who I am. So um, my parents, uh, I have, you know, two parents they are still together, have done an amazing job of raising me and my siblings. So I have an older brother, a younger sister, and a younger brother as well. Um, we're all fairly close, so I'm still talking everything like that. Um, so yeah, man. Um, I've actually been more more than fortunate for like my family life, for, like growing up and things like that. So I I grew up most or had for most of my life. I still had both sets of my grandparents. Um, my grand my one grandfather passed away. I think it's been seven years ago now. Um, but for the most part, I had both sets of my grandparents around. Um, come from two big Catholic families, so lots of aunts and uncles and cousins, and that was really kind of like my social life and our social life growing up was just hanging around family, taking care of each other, helping each other out. And uh, yeah, so I think that's kind of really laid the groundwork for kind of how I wanted to live my life and kind of just how I knew to live my life. It was, just like, it was all about like just helping people, being there for each other. And yeah, so that's, that's one of the uh, biggest compliments. I think I went to uh, um, so the Sharper Business um, uh, workshop last week. I went down there and Randy, our disco guy, he went out, he and I went out to dinner with um, another couple. They were kind of picking our brains about business and stuff like that. And um, the wife asked Randy, said, what, you know, what's one of the best things that you enjoy about Brian and his leadership and how he's, he's leading the team and, and being your boss and stuff like that. And Randy said that he's like, I don't think there's a day that goes by that Brian doesn't just ask me like, hey, is there anything I can help you with? Or how can I help you today? Is there anything I can do for you today? And honestly, like, that's one of the best compliments I can get. Like, I, I really enjoy that. I, I want people to think that about me. I want people to like, kind of, they trust me, they rely on me, but then I am really there 
to help. Um, and really that kind of stemmed completely from my parents. Uh, my parents are very selfless, selfless people. Uh, my mom was always helping out in school and, you know, doing anything she could. Um, she was like, you know, the parent, te- the parent teacher association. She was like the leader of that, which sometimes works against me a little bit when I was a little, uh, ornery growing up and stuff, but, uh, that was good. And then my dad, um, I, one of the best things I can say, like I tell people all the time, like my dad is the nicest person I've ever met in my life. So, um, so, I mean, it's, it's such a cool thing to say, uh, I feel very blessed and, you know, humbled by what they've been able to do for me and throughout my life and stuff. I, like I said, that kind of really laid the groundwork for who I am and, and what I kind of wanted to do um, throughout my life. Yeah. So did you grow up on a, on a farm? Like, did you do farm activities, baling hay, uh, shucking corn? Yeah. I don't know what, I'm not a farm boy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm so, talking about. But <laughs> yeah. So my, um, so my grandparents own a farm. Um, so we, um, and then, uh, so we used to go up there all the time and work. Um, so we, we, I, we kind of lived in, you know, a, a local city, um, you know, where we were. So I was always, it's kind of two things. So either I was either, da- either down at the basketball court, like playing, like, in the city where I was from, or I was, it's a, you know, it's a farm, um, helping my grandfather out with stuff. So yeah, so we were literally, you know, bailing hay is, um, pretty, I mean, I was pretty young out there. I remember me and my older brother, like just, you know, picking up bales of hay, we were each on either side and lifting it up onto the wagon and stuff. So we were, we were doing that pretty young and things. And then just, uh, yeah, the, the summers too, just, you know, taking care of the garden, shucking corn and things like that. Um, their, their farm is mostly crops. Um, uh, we did have some cattle, so we got to, got to be involved in butchering cows every now and then and stuff. So it was, it's kind of always funny. Every time, like, we'd, we'd butcher cows, my dad would always, like, bring, like, cow parts in, like, do, like, a show and tell, like, as far as our science classes and stuff like that. It was, like, always, like, a cool day. And, like, all the, the teachers always loved it and the kids always loved it and stuff. So it's kind of – it seems a little morbid thinking back out of it. Like, it was, it was, like, kind of a cool thing to do. Yeah, I, I wonder if they would lo- allow that today. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Well, that's awesome. And then you you mentioned basketball. Obviously, I was a basketball player too, and I think you played high school basketball. And uh, you're always the the scrappy one. I hear you were the guy that everybody taunted, yeah. or, or maybe you were the one taunting. I don't know. <laughs> a little bit. So I was. The, yeah, I was definitely uh, the person on the other team that usually the the other fans did not like. Um, you know, I was pretty pretty intense and. Um, you know, just really aggressive and stuff like that. So, um, I remember know, I like I, back I in the senior year, I remember back in the day, I always enjoyed watching uh, the Detroit Pistons and because they were kind of like the bad boys, right? They, yeah. nobody liked them, yeah. but they won. And it reminds yeah. me of you. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you think back to like one of my favorite players, like growing up of all, of all time was, uh, um, Wojciechowski for Duke. Like he just like, you know, it wasn't the most gifted athletically or anything like that, but man, he hustled all the time and, you know, stopped the court and played some defense and, you know, that was me. So, um, you know, I think my senior year, I, you know, I, I led our team in assists and everything like that. So I was a, I was a distributor, but I think I also led our team in intentional fouls, which <laughs> that was not the purpose. I wasn't like a dirty player, but I was just, I was aggressive and, you know, kind of, that's funny. That's, how I played and stuff. I didn't so, even yeah. know they kept that stat. <laughs> yeah that's funny well that's awesome man so uh grew up on the farm basketball player a uh, team player and then he decided to become a teacher when did that come about um were you around teachers um no actually no at the time nobody was it's, it's funny now to think about it because there are a lot of teachers in my family now like between aunts and cousins and, and stuff like that so there's a lot there i'm around a lot of teachers but like at the time um when I decided to become a teacher, like, no, I didn't really have any teachers to, you know, ask advice on. I'm sure they would tell you like, don't do it. But, um, <laughs> so no, I wasn't really around teachers, but honestly, I, I didn't know what I, you know, you and I have had this conversation multiple times. And it's kind of funny. You're, you know, kind of one of the goals behind your podcast and the, you know, the, the thing is like live your purpose. And that's something I've always struggled with is kind of figuring out what my purpose is. And I'm, I'm really good at like kind of taking other people's ideas and maybe running with that and stuff, but trying to figure out what I want to do for myself. It's always been a struggle. Um, but you know, it was, it was the same thing in, edu- in going into education. Um, I started off in, um, college. I started off as a psychology major. Um, so I realized I wanted to help people want to be able to listen and help people that way. I really didn't have any idea what, know what psychology was or what it all entailed and stuff. Um, thought it was a good thing. Um, started off in that I think I failed my first psychology class so that was that did not go very well and stuff realized I probably wanted to do something else and honestly I was just sitting around talking to my mom one time she said why don't you just be a teacher I was like okay I'll be a teacher like, I, you know, I can do that so that's literally how it came about and once I got in my education classes like I really enjoyed it um really 
you know, I think I once I became an education major, I think I got below like I got A's on like all those classes, and then my GPA like skyrocketed and stuff. Once I got an education, I kind of found my niche there, and and really it's had I had fun with it. I, it was something I was able to kind of use my creativity. Um, I was never somebody that could kind of just you know open up the book and like, hey kids, let's go page one, page two. Like, it was never about that for me. It was something I always wanted to, you know, like I said, use my creativity, come up with new lessons and new experiences. And and it was pretty easy to see, like, right away that, like, oh, man, I can make a difference in, in these children's lives and stuff. It's, it was it was pretty amazing. So so you um, became, you uh, were a middle school teacher. Is that right? Like, yeah. um, so you got a middle school education. Why did you choose middle school rather than elementary or high school? Yeah, I started off as um, I started off in doing high school. Um, I was going to be a math major and started off in uh, doing wanting to do high school. And then really, once I started getting into it a little bit more, I really kind of realized that I like I love that age range of like fourth through sixth grade. That's like my favorite age range. The kids are so creative. The kids, I mean, they I don't know they're they still want to please you. They're still they still want the best for you. They kind of haven't been jaded. They don't have too big attitudes. I, so I, I really taught like fourth through eighth grade, just a variety of different, you know, throughout my career and stuff like that. So I was kind of all over the place. And, um, but yeah, man, that, that fourth through sixth grade age range is, is one of my favorites. I really enjoyed yeah. that. And uh, it's kind of what I just kind of gravitated towards. Yeah. No, I definitely, it's, it's been crazy because <clears throat> Kaylin, she's getting ready to turn 14 and uh, she's in the eighth grade. And yeah, I think it's just changed a lot in the past couple of years, but when she was, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Uh, yeah, very creative and, uh, and outgoing and it was, it's a fun and she still is, it is a fun age, but, uh, but I definitely get what you're saying. So, so you taught, uh, you taught school for 14 years. What was that experience like? Like if I was a middle school boy, I'm seventh grader, I'm coming into Mr. Snyder's class and I see you. And then what am I, what's my expectations for that year? What am I going to get? Yeah. Um, it's actually, it's actually kind of the same thing as, as <laughs> some of the stuff I, I talk to our team about like today is like one of my things that, you know, you, if you're in any of our meetings, you always catch me saying like, Hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to praise everybody for our wins. I'm going to celebrate our wins and talk about them, but I'm also going to push you as much as I can. Like I'm going to always kind of, my motto is like, whatever you're doing, you can always do it better. Um, that's how I am in real estate within our business. That's how I was as a teacher too. No matter what I taught, I knew that I could teach it better the next time I taught it. Um, so that was kind of my, my philosophy. And it was the same thing with my students. So that's kind of what I put onto them a little bit of like, Hey, no matter what you're doing now, you can always do better. You can always be better. And, you know, really kind of want the best for themselves out of their, out of their life and other lessons. Um, I was a, I was, I was a, I would say I wasn't the best student. I was a good student when it came to grades and getting, you know, getting, getting grades. That, that was no, no problem for me, but I was that student that like, School was very easy for me. Like I never learned how to study. I never learned how to push myself. I think it still honestly holds me back a little bit today. Um, but so I wanted to make sure that like with with the kiddos in class, my students, I kind of did my best to push them in any way that I could to kind of get them out of their comfort zone a little bit, have them experiences experience failures from time to time. You're not always going to know the answer. You're not always going to be able to kind of figure it out. Sometimes you're going to have to ask for help. Sometimes you're going to have to take, you know, multiple different strategies to problem solve. And that was really kind of my philosophy behind teaching. And I was a little unorthodox teacher. Like you walk in, like first thing I did every year, no matter where, where my classroom was, I moved my classroom around a couple of times and stuff. But like, I, um, like I never had a, a, a desk as a teacher. Like the first thing I got rid of was my desk. So I never had like an actual teacher desk. I, I stood like all day long. Like if I wore a pedometer, like I'd walk like, you know, 10 miles every day, like around my classroom and stuff. But it's really just about going around and, and talking to my students and just asking them questions. Um, it's one of the things like I was very rarely like up at the board, like teaching a lesson. It was more just like putting out a, you know, in dip, in, an in-depth question for them, like where they really had to problem solve as a math teacher, this is, you know, kind of the philosophy I kind of took on most of those time is really just kind of put out like one really big in-depth question and like have them problem solve through it look at different multiple strategies on how to solve it, kind of figure that out, share with each other, you know, learn from each other, that kind of thing. But honestly, the biggest part of my job is I just walk around all day long and just ask the question, why? Mm. So um, student would sit there and be like, you know, typical students would be like, Hey, Mr. Snyder, is this the right answer? And I, I just answer something like, I don't know. You tell me, you tell me if it's the right answer. Like explain to me how you did it. Or that typical, like they would like, I'd look over their paper, or look at the paper and be like, Oh, why did you do that? And right away, like that first day in class, what you probably would have done, Brett, is you would have just erased it, assuming <laughs> that I was 
that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. But really what I want to do is I just want to figure out what your mindset was. I want to mm -hmm. figure out why you did that. So, Interesting. you know, it's always kind of funny as they, by the end of the year, that was, I mean, as a typical thing, they would do that with each other. They'd be like, Oh, okay. So, Oh, you got, you know, you did that a different way than me. Like, how did you do that? And stuff. So it was never about like really getting the right or wrong answer, but it was all about like understanding why you got the answer you did. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was kind of, yeah. you know, really what I took on as a teacher and, and really what I wanted to portray through my students too. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny. I, I bet some kids really, really love that philosophy and some kids like hated it. They're like, I, well, I got the yeah. right answer. I don't, I don't have to show my work, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, but, and I, I, that's the thing though. I, it, I didn't really care about the, like, it wasn't about showing their work or anything, but if they could explain it to me, I was okay with it. Yeah. So, so yeah. I w I was that kid all the time that I would figure out different. I always got in trouble in school because I would find out new, I would figure out new ways to do problems because I was bored and I wanted to figure this out. I right? do things in my head. And so yeah, I always got in trouble for that. So um, maybe it's it was awesome. overcompensating a little bit, but I realized that it was all about figuring out why you're doing stuff. It was, it was kind of crazy. I remember teaching a sixth grade lesson one time and um, I don't know, I think it was on um, just division of fractions and reciprocals. And like, I literally was doing the problem in front of the class like explaining kind of the process and stuff like that. And I stood back and I was like, Oh, that's why we do that. Mm. Like I never caught onto it until, I mean, I was probably eight years into my teaching career at this time. It was the first time I taught that lesson because that, that grade level, but like throughout, you know, middle school and high school and college classes, like that, nobody had ever explained to me why we did that particular thing and the reason behind it. And then I realized like, I was a, a big moment for me. Like, Oh, if I can understand or I can get my kids to understand why we're doing certain things it's going to stick with them. And if they can figure out why on their own, that's even going to stick with them even more. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, I want to kind of ask you this question. This is, you know, something I was going to talk about later in the show, but it's funny because you mentioned being a teacher was very similar to being a CEO, like leading a team in our real estate company. Uh, so, you know, t take yourself back in their teaching days. I mean, you're teaching students how to do things, why they do things, the process of coming up with the answer. I mean, do you find a lot of similarities to what you did as a teacher and what you do as a CEO? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of transferable skills um, coming from teachers. And honestly, from teachers to be able to do like any, you know, really a lot of different professions, um, I think it's a great kind of resource for them to be because they have a lot of transferable skills. Like, mm -hmm. I, I learned how to communicate. I learned how to be patient. I learned how to, you know, really kind of, you know, focus on process and systems and, and reasons behind stuff. But the, you know, one of the biggest things too, is that with our team, whether it's, you know, our team members here, like in Indianapolis or our team members that are over in the Philippines as virtual assistants or a contractor we're working with or anything, I, same thing of like, if, if we're changing a process or changing a system or they're struggling with some, getting something done, it always comes back to it like, Hey, this is why we do this. You know, I'm not just asking you, it's not, it's not the typical, like, Hey, we just do this because we've always done it. That's my least favorite answer <laughs> any, to that question. But it's always like, Hey, I want to explain why we do it. And then explain to them, like, how can we come, how can we become more efficient at what we're doing? So and, it's you know, funny. Change things up. It's funny. Cause, uh, you know, when you started working with our team and I was kind of running the meetings and sometimes you would ask that question, you're just like, Hey, why do we do this? And yeah. that was my answer. I was like, well, I don't know. We've <laughs> always just done it that way. And he's like, that's not a good answer. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, hey, uh, so basically you were teaching for 14 years in Ohio. And then, like I said, you went from Ohio to Indiana. I'm sure that was a tough move because you're a big Buckeye fan. I'm sure you were driving. I'm a Buckeye fan. Still a Buckeye fan. So I'm, 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 I don't think I'm ever going to leave. Which the funny thing is, actually growing up, I was never an Ohio State fan. I think it was just because I was like so local and like everybody else in Champaign State. I had to be the antagonist. So. There were times I rooted for Michigan. There were times I rooted for Notre Dame. But then really when it came down to it, and I was like, okay, I am really a Buckeye fan. This is who I am. <laughs> I, I accept it and stuff. And I just want to antagonize people. But yeah, so, you know, I was I lived in Ohio my entire life. Um, really, I went to – actually, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. My first year of teaching was in Charlotte, North Carolina, intercity. Um, interesting. I learned a lot about myself, a lot about teaching. Um, and that, but then I moved back um, to Columbus after that year. And really, just got, that's where I was my entire life. And um, my wife, Anna was living here in Indianapolis and we met, um, and basically for a year, we did the whole driving back and forth every other weekend thing. She would either come to Columbus or I'd come to Indianapolis. And honestly, when it came down to it is it was, it was very easy for me to make the decision about, yeah, I have no problem moving to Indianapolis. Um, the first time I came out here for the, for like, it was our second date. She came to Columbus for our first date. And our second date, I came to Indianapolis. It was the first time I'd ever been in Indianapolis. Wow. Um, so that was 
that's pretty interesting. And then, yeah. So then it where'd you guys go? Nine, nine months remember? later, I made the decision. Um, <laughs> went to, went to, we went to Rick's boat house. Um, okay. so I remember that church at E nine one. Um, no, yeah, that's so, where I was. Yeah. That's where I went. That's where I met Anna. Yep, uh, that's exactly right. So <laughs> they have some good stuff there and yeah, definitely remember that. And the second time we came out, we did a brewery tour. So I, I, I remember that too. You're, all the, you were all, all in, you're like, breweries. man, Indy's got a lot of breweries. This is cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that was good. Um, well, that's awesome. So you met Anna and that's how, how we got, uh, acquainted. Yeah. We are mutual friends. And, uh, so you decided, you know, how, how did you decide to move to Indianapolis? You and Anna got pretty serious in your relationship and you're, you're planning on getting married and yeah. what did that look like? And then how did you decide on what to do? Yeah, it was, a uh, um, like I said, it kind of was an easy decision, but it was, a, it was a big decision now that I really look back at it. So really what my plan was, what my, what I what was supposed to happen in Ohio is that I was supposed to teach for one more year in Ohio. And then I was going to become the principal like the next year. Like that was the plan that I had mapped out that like kind of the superintendent, like it was kind of like, Hey, I think this is the way this is going to go and, and stuff like that. And then I made the decision of like, you no, know, I, 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 you know, I'm ready to, you know, move to Indianapolis and, and get out of here. And obviously I knew my relationship with Anna was going to be a lot bigger, um, like a life choice and life decision and a better thing for me and for us together for, you know, so it really ended up being a very easy decision, but it was a big decision for me to kind of make that to about here. And then at the time, I mean, she had a, she had a good job and I realized like, Hey, it's going to be really easy for me to get a teaching job in Indianapolis. So I think that was part of it too. It was like, I knew I could move out here and get a job pretty easily compared to maybe her uprooting her family's out here and, and she wanted to stay here and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so it kind of made, made an easy decision. So it was kind of funny too. I just came out one random day, one, like, I think I took off of a Friday from school in Ohio and just came out here one Friday and like literally just found three Catholic schools that, uh, that were hiring. And I drove around to all three and just walked in and said, Hey, can I talk to the principal? Had interviews all three of them and I got offered the job like within a week from all three of those schools and stuff. So it actually ended up being really easy um, to find a job out here. So I was right on that point. That's cool. So, uh, so you moved to Indianapolis, um, you and Anna had gotten married now and you taught out in Indianapolis for how many years? Yeah, I taught three years out here. Three. So, okay. Yeah. And, and we met, uh, so we were kind of mutual friends. Um, I went to East 91st Street Christian Church in Indianapolis. Anna went there at that time, and we had some mutual friends that went there. And uh, we were part of a kind of a ministry called The Great Banquet, and that was a big part of our group. And we had some parties together. We always, I don't know, had a couple of parties, maybe a Thanksgiving, Christmas party. And, and that's how we met, right? But actually, the very first time we met was... <laughs> Was it when was the first time that we met? I think the first time we met was actually your son's, uh, Ethan's first birthday. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, I always I, it was funny because I, yeah, we, um, like with our group of friends, like I met all the other friends in it, like the group we were kind of hanging out with. I met all of them before Anna and I actually got married. And then you and Karen were like kind of the last couple that we met and stuff. But like yeah. Anna always said, like, oh, yeah, you would get along with Brett. And I just assumed, like, oh, yeah, we're going to be good. Like, and then, we met. I was like, okay, yeah, we will be good. We can talk about basketball. We can have a beer. Yeah, we're good. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I, uh, I was probably just in the trenches of the business at that time, and uh, that's probably why we didn't get to meet till later on because I was I was super busy with the business and we were having yeah. kids and um, and all that. But let's just take us in. So we met. We kind of built you know a relationship. We uh, had had a friendship, but. Then three and a half years ago, uh, we had that breakfast, and just kind of give me your take on that. Uh, what you know, I know what it was in my mind, but what was in your mind? We decided, hey, let's get together for breakfast and uh, take it from there. Yeah, it, it was it was kind of funny because we were just getting ready, or we were just getting together for breakfast, just like catch up, and you know, we do that regularly and stuff, so it wasn't a big deal. And um, yeah, through that conversation, it was kind of just like you knew. I think well through other times we met, like you knew that I was kind of like, oh man, I need to figure out something else to do. I had realized at that point, like I did not want to become a principal. Um, the more I kind of started doing more stuff around that, and I was like, realized I did not want to do that. Um, so I wanted to do something else. And um, you kind of knew that and things. And I kind of, I think I told you at that um, breakfast is like, Hey, I think I'm, I think I'm going to teach for one more year and be done. I think I'm going to try to figure out something else to do right after this. And The thing and was though, I, I remember it, that, that wasn't the first time you said that. I mean, I remember, I think right, you said yeah. the year before, maybe even the year before, and I just, yeah. I knew that you weren't happy and you kept going. And I was like, man, like, if you want to not do it, just don't do it. I mean, that's my, that's yeah. my, 
Yeah. That's my thing. So, <laughs> yeah. And then I think at that time you had just let go of like your marketing person um, that was doing some marketing and kind of leading your meetup and, and stuff like that. And you had this big, uh, big plan to come out with this education course and um, you're going to teach people how to wholesale and, you know, come out with this that kind of education platform and stuff like that. So I just do conversations like, yeah, hey, no, maybe this would work out. Maybe this one. I think I tried to convince you like, Hey, just hire me part time and I'll still teach one more year. And I was like, I think I'll be okay. I think I can figure it out. And you're like, no, let's, this needs to be something that we can do. You know, I need to be a full-time position. I want you kind of in our meetings on Fridays and, and stuff like that. And and really, I think it's kind of, you and I both is like, oh, it's a possibility. And I think it was like the next day we had another conversation and, and then, uh, you know, you're like, yeah, I think we can do this. I think I told you like, Hey, match my teacher salary. And yeah. which is on the teacher salary. You're like, Oh, I can do that. That's not, you know, I, think still low, I think you still tried to low ball. I did. I tried to negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to negotiate. I'm always, I'm always yeah. like that. And I'm a fast mover. And, uh, we actually have something really cool at the end of the show that we're going to do. Um, but I didn't really interview you. I mean, it was more like, Hey, this sounds really cool. Yeah. And, and it's funny because we were doing the meetup. I, we had been doing the simple wholesaling meetup for about a year, a year and a half, something like that. And, uh, and the very first meetup after you came on board, you were like leading, <laughs> leading the meetup. I said, yeah. Hey Brian, you're going to, you're going to go up there yeah. and you're going to lead this. So and- <laughs> to go, to go back like a week before that, I think, I think it was like the first week It's like either like the first week or the second week that we did that meetup. But even before that, like, so I took this job with you. And I, I literally knew nothing about real estate. I didn't know what wholesaling was. Or, I mean, so it's kind of crazy. It's definitely not a, it was definitely a situation of like, hey, you probably shouldn't hire like this. But I think it really like looking back into it was like, hey, you were kind of investing in really the person, not necessarily the, the process or the, you know, kind of the, the background and experience and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of a <laughs> steep learning curve of like, hey, I got to figure out what real estate wholesaling even is. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I realized pretty quickly, I'm like, and even I say that too, like they didn't know what it was either. Or anything like, that. like, like you know, did you look up anything? Did you try to like Google it or figure out? I mean, I know we had conversations about what it was, but did you do any yeah. type of research on your own or were you just like, Oh, I'll figure it out. Whatever. Yeah. That was kind of, kind of that's, that was kind of how it was. <laughs> like I'll figure it out and, and be okay with it. So I listened to like some of your guys, you and Jaren's podcast and stuff. Listen to a couple of those episodes and things. But yeah. yeah. So then it was literally like, I think it was like this, that it, if it wasn't the first week, it was definitely like early the second week of, of me working with you guys. And it was like, Hey, we have this meetup. And you, you were like, I, I think you can go ahead and be in charge and run the meetup and stuff. And <laughs> That's like, funny. all right, let's figure this out. So, um, <laughs> That's funny. And, and, and the, th- the thing was, yeah, we were going to come out with an education course, simple wholesaling, yeah. uh, you know, and, and you were a teacher and you kept talking about coming out with this course and literally, um, you know, we started this and a couple months later I go to a mastermind group and I'm a big guy on freedom, right? I mean, if you hear me, I got freedom Fridays that we talk, that I talk about how to build freedom, how to scale your business to freedom. So I'm a big guy on freedom. So we're sitting at this mastermind group and we got the wholesaling real estate business over here. We're flipping 200 properties, 300 properties a year. And then we're just going to do this education course. And someone got up and they said, well, that sounds really great if you want two full-time jobs. <laughs> and I said, I'm a guy, you know, I don't want that. I want the freedom. So I came home and I scrapped the whole real estate course. So what was your feeling when I did that? Like, what, what were you thinking? Like, what in the heck am I doing here? That was, that was an everyday thing with you, Brett. So <laughs> I kind of, no. Um, no, I think it understood it. Cause I, I think right away you and I were actually be, we're pretty, I think we were able to be pretty open and transparent about everything that's kind of that was going on. So I think actually after that, I think you were one of the first people that like, I just, I, that you talked to about it and kind of like, Hey, this is what they thought. And this is what they said. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And mm-hmm. I mean, looking back at it too, it was, it was really easy to see within our team that there was a split between our team of there was like maybe one or two people that wanted to do the education stuff. They were in that boat. And then there were, you know, four or five, uh, four or five people that were kind of in the, Hey, this is, we, this, you're like pulling our resources and this doesn't make sense. This is what we do. So seeing that, that now and thinking about that, like, yeah, that probably, that was the right decision. Cause that would have, that would have split the team, I think even more. And mm-hmm. I think people will get into it. They don't realize like, Hey, you need to have an integrator or a, you know, 
somebody that can run the operations for each part of your business and cr- so you can operate it, you know, efficiently and stuff like that. So, exactly. Um, I think that's yeah, a big, time, I think we were, that's a yeah. big thing is uh, right now, I mean, we're, we're doing, you're doing a lot of education. You're leading a lot of education. We have the Facebook group, the wholesaling made simple. We still have the wholesaling made simple meetup. We're putting out content yeah. all the time. We're teaching wholesalers. We have small groups of wholesalers that we teach and, um, but I think the difference is is that you and the leaders of the team really enjoy doing it. That's what you want to do. Unlike before, yeah. it was like some people wanted to, some people didn't, and it was like I don't know. So totally agree with yeah. that. Yeah, I think I think that makes a big difference. And then stuff too. We know when to say it's a big thing is too. We know when to say no. So if it's you know hey, if we have to do this, then we're you know we're gonna have to take away from something else. So being able to know when to say no makes a difference. And there's always decisions of like I'm go through like I'm asked all the time, and you know it's really no different than kind of what it was before, but like people are asking for more like legit, like, Hey, I need to, I want you to be like, take me through a coaching course and do that. Like we, we don't offer that. Like mm-hmm. we, we probably could, but that's not something that we have built into our team right now. And stuff. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. the simple wholesaling company. So you kind of came on as a marketing guy, literally a few months later, uh, Jaron had left the company and we had a spot open, the dispositions manager and the dispositions manager is the person who sells all of our properties and builds the relationship with the investors. And I said, Brian, Brian, do you want to, to do that? So you said, sure. So you stepped into the sales role. Uh, and then the transition with that is a year later, I really was always wanting an implementer, a CEO person to really run the operations and you had been showing leadership. So you became the COO. And then about a year later, I really wanted total freedom and to really get out of the business. And I asked if you want to just run everything as a CEO. So it was kind of just a natural progression from year to year, you stepping up as a leader. Uh, it, it sounds like it's an easy thing. And you even said in this interview that a lot of times things come easy to you. Uh, teaching came easy to you. You've always been a leader in the teaching field. You went to three Catholic schools and they offered you a job on the spot. In our company, you've trained you know, progress to the CEO uh, pretty quickly. So, you know, what's, what's that like to you? I mean, do you think that this business is, is still coming easy? Like what challenges you, what challenges have you ran into uh, as run this company? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, honestly, it's the same challenges that everybody has with, if you're in this business. It comes down to having inventory and that your marketing is you're getting the most out of your marketing dollars that you can. Um, those are the things that I lose sleep over that I, you know, that, that stress me out that, <clears throat> you know, really, I really, I need to spend time on and, and think about and analyze and stuff. So it's really that, you know, our expenses are where they need to be. So everybody can, you know, so we, we basically, everybody can eat and like they need to, that we're making money, um, things like that. But then really it comes down to two of just like, we, we need inventory and properties and, you know, we're, we're just last week I bought a deal. I know it's going to be a bad deal. And I was like, Oh man, I like, I, I was too anxious. About that. I needed, <clears throat> you know, it was all about, I needed properties. So like, man, I, I jumped on deals too quick. So those are the things, those are the big challenges. But aside from those things that everybody deals with within this business, that's, I mean, you talk to anybody in real estate, that's, that's going to be an issue within their business and what they're doing and stuff. Um, but I mean, other than that, it's the challenges. And I think it's a challenge that, a lot of leaders deal with is just operating a team and running a team and managing the team and being, being in charge of when you're in that, when you're in that CEO role and, and it's, it's a, it's a different than just being a manager of a team and you still have somebody over see, overseeing you and kind of making the decisions. But when you come into that CEO role, it's like, Oh man, like their well being is kind of on me. Like I need to make sure that our guys get enough deals so they can feed their families. It's not just like, Oh, so our, our company can make money and we're doing okay. It's like, man, these guys need to feed their family. I need to provide them with enough opportunity. I need to provide them with enough support and enough help to have them reach whatever goals they have um, for our team. And then also it's, man, I want to make sure I help them out with their personal goals as well um, outside of our business and things. So um, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that, but honestly, that's one of the challenges that I love of what it is like, and, you know, we've, we've had this conversation before of like, like real, like real estate doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. Like it's, I'm not, there's some people out there like, ah, oh, man, I just, I'm ready for the next deal. I want to, I want to find it. I want to do that. That's not me. Like I enjoy analyzing deals. I like the analytical side of it, but what I really enjoy is the, the team part of it, the aspect part of it and the, that efficiency part of operating the people and the systems and the processes within the team. So 
that's one of my favorite things. And that can, that's, I see a lot of business owners that really, that are challenged by that because they're more like the deal people and, mm. and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. I think um, that's, I think that's why you've been so successful as run the company and CEO. And a lot of people really struggle is because you are all about the team. You are all about the systems and the processes. And most of the time, the CEO is the owner of the company and he's, he's the guy that gets, gets hungry for deals and maybe he's a good salesperson, but he's not good at, at systems. And that's why it's so important to have someone on your team that really is, uh, all into the systems and processes. Um, you know, so what would you kind of advise that person out there? I mean, we talk to entrepreneurs all the time and a lot of times they're like, man, I just want, I want a Brian Snyder. I want a, yeah, a COO or a CEO. And I just don't want all this on me. Like I, I'm losing sleep. I'm super stressed out. I have a lot of anxiety and it's a lot of pressure. And I don't like making all these big decisions all the time by myself. Um, so what would you advise that person they're looking for a number two, maybe person on their team or maybe even number one? Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's, that's a really tough thing. Um, because, and I, I think it's tough to answer almost because I thought with you and I, it happened so naturally. Mm -hmm. Um, but then my reflection is always like, cause that's honestly, that's like probably the number one question I get from, from other business owners and CEOs and stuff like that is like, how do I find my Brian? How do I find a person that can, that can do that? Um, and, and really what it comes down to, like I said, it's kind of a little weird because it was so natural with us. But then I think when I, when I reflect on that and think about that, it really comes down to of like, you, number one, you and I, we, we communicate the same way, not, you know, not, we don't send out emails the same way and, you know, things like, but we're, we, we're able to receive communication the same way. So I think that's helped out both of us of being kind of in that same realm. Um, when you look at your, CEO and COO or your integrator, whatever you want to call it. When you look at those two rules, they need to be able to communicate in a, you know, in a kind of in a streamlined thing versus if they're on opposite ends of communication, they're going to struggle. It's going to be a tough thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then also too, is that the transparency that comes along with it is I feel like you and I have been able to have some pretty difficult sister, uh, like conversations that weren't difficult for us mm -hmm. because it was just like, Hey, this is, Hey, I need to talk to you about this or, you need to talk to me about this. And we were able to have those conversations. Um, but then too, is that we have, we have the same core values. Um, we, you know, we want kind of the, you know, we want the kind of the same thing. It was never about like growing this huge business and making as much money as we can. That's a side effect of, Hey, we want to, we want our, we want our team engaged. We want our, you know, we want to look out for their best interest. We want, you know, to help them reach their goals, you know, professionally and personally. Um, I think it's one of the biggest things that kind of helped, help, helped us out through that process. Um, but then too, a, a big part of this too, is that I thought you trusted me. So mm -hmm. maybe, I, you know, I earned that trust along the way, but also it takes a lot for a leader to give up, to actually trust somebody in that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a huge thing. And it's, it's not easy to do. I mean, I struggle with that, you know, on, on micro levels and, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a control. I like to be in control. I like to make decisions. I like to see that kind of planned out. And, and you like that as well, but be able to trust somebody to be like, Hey, okay, they're, they're going to let it go. And maybe that's not the way that I would do it, but I'm going to see how this plays out. And usually when that happened and you were feeling like that, it usually ended up okay. We ended up usually on the, on, you know, on the OK side. And I do the same thing with our, with our leaders. Now the people that are on our leadership team, I need to, Hey, this is, this is your thing. You do your thing with it. And I hopefully I don't really have to have dig into it with you because I, I'm going to trust you to do this. And yeah, I think that's a that's a huge challenge for a lot of people. But when you're able to do that, when you have the it's two things, you have to have that right person, but then you have to be able to trust them to kind of do their job as well. Yeah, it's funny uh, looking back. I mean, sometimes we worry and fear about these small micro level things. And one of the things that I really you know, there, there was certain things, tasks that I never thought that I could ever give up. I was like, I'm never going to be able to give this up for some reason. I don't know. I've made something up in my head, uh, you know, and, and I let things go. And then usually, like you said, they ended up being okay. Uh, you know, when I well, never even actually on that note, not to cut you off or anything, Brad, but I like thinking about that, actually, I never really thought about that aspect, but you saying that there were even things that like, not necessarily that I took over where I would just be like, Hey, why don't you let, Roxanne do this or why don't you let Anna do this or 
Randy, did, yeah, I, like people on our team, like, hey, why don't you just let them do this and see how it works? And generally in that case, you're like, oh, yeah, that's, it's done. I like that's they, they do it better than I do. Like, it's good. Yeah. yeah. I know. So and it's some funny. Training, some onboarding, but yeah. It's funny. I don't know if it's like addictive, but now like it's, um, <laughs> it's sometimes just a mindset mindset thing too, because sometimes I'll have to do something and I'm like, why do I have to do this? You know, I, it could be writing an email. Like I shouldn't have to write an email. I don't know. Some, anyways, <laughs> yeah, I think you put that in my head, but, uh, what did you see with the other leaders on the team? Uh, so I stepped out and I saw what happened with you. I mean, you really stepped up, but there's some other leaders on our team too. Like what have you seen in the past nine months uh, with the rest of the team. Yeah. I, th I, th I think a big thing with that too, is just like involving them on, Hey, I'm really not going to make any decisions every now and then. Yeah. I do have to make a decision that, you know, and then tell them afterwards, but you, for the most part, I would say, you know, 90 to 95% of our decisions are made as a team. And we have a discussion about it before things are just kind of like, Hey, let's do this and, and, and rule it out. So I think them, them being involved, but then also like letting them know, like, Hey, this is like, I'm going to entrust you with this. Like, this is your responsibility. Like let's get it handled and, and you know, things like that. So empowering them to lead in certain areas. Um, but then also just have those discussions too of like, Hey, here's, here's what I want to do with you. And here's my goal for you, you know, financial, I want to get you to this level and really kind of have those open conversations with them of like, Hey, if we, if, if, if I can get you to this level, can, you know, can I trust you to do this, this, and this? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really what it kind of came into. And I, it's really worked for us. And yeah. I, I think we've been open and honest and, you know, we, we know how much, like, although we, like we kind of know how much each, each other makes and things. And that's not a lot of times that in a business, but is it really like that? But it's, that's, what's kind of worked for us because we're all working towards that same goal and, you know, we're doing it together. And I think when they kind of have that um, thought process of, the empowerment, but also kind of the decision-making process of being involved in it, but then kind of just that, that outlook of like, Hey, we are, we are working towards this together. It makes a big difference. Yeah, definitely. I think just giving your team ownership of it's funny because if, you make a decision or I make a decision and we say, Hey, here's what we're going to do. They might do it. Yeah. They might not. But if you can get everybody involved and everybody kind of comes up with a decision together, that's something that I've really tried to learn. Uh, I'm a very fast mover, very quick decision maker. Sure. Let's just do it. Let's go. But yeah. now even to this day, I mean, I think we had a conversation yesterday and it's just about some sort of process or system. And I'm like, let's just think about it. You know, let's talk to the other people to team members and maybe come up with some sort of system. But I used to be like, yeah, let's do it. Go done. And I don't know. So anyways, that's just something yeah. I think we all have to kind of learn, get the team involved. I think it's just, um, they can really step up. Brian, I want to yeah. ask well, you, I think one of ahead. the, I think one of the things just on that note real quick on, on that, like I see a, where a lot of leaders struggle with that. I think it's really easy to just kind of roll out a plan and say, Hey, this is, these are our, these are our goals for the quarter. These are our goals for the year. Like, here's what we're going to do to get there and not really involve them on that process. So this kind of honestly comes back to the same thing with teaching. This is what I did with teaching. is like, hey, we need to be able to get to this point where we can divide fractions, you know, be able to get there. How are we going to do that? And really, I came up with a plan with my students of like, hey, what, what are the steps that we need to take to get there? And we go through that. And yes, I was leading that conversation. They didn't really know how to get to that. But they felt like they were involved in it and they had ownership of that too. They got to set the goals. They got to, they helped me like set the like kind of timeline with that. It's the same thing with, you know, running a business of involve your, not just your leaders, but your team as well. If there's anybody that's involved in that and involve them in that process and you can lead that conversation. You can get them to the point that you want them to get to, but allow them to kind of get there to help you get there on your, on their own too. I think it makes it, that's, it's huge. Yeah. And I think you're really good at that. I mean, you set goals for you to get out of certain tasks too. Uh, I think you said, "Hey, if I'm doing this task, or I, if I'm having if I'm having to look at a deal and help analyze it by this time next year, something's wrong." And I think that yeah. you know we we can't be doing that. So you set those goals. It's not just money goals, but it's like how can you? And that's true growth, right? I mean that that is true yeah. growth to really to really do that. Brian, uh, recently, uh, so Anna, so we'll get back to Anna. She had a great job and she stepped away and she uh, has a coaching certification and she's really great at human resources and, uh, you know, figuring out how do you hire people? What are the, 
documentation that you need, the compliance things. And she's really been helping out our team with that. And uh, it, we were sitting in a coaching meeting and we have all these boxes with everybody's name in it of all the tasks and, and who's responsible for what. And you were in like almost half of our business as far as the boxes, like you're responsible, people reporting you to this. And we all said, Brian, you need to get out of some of those boxes. You need some help. And that's when I kind of on, I came in this picture and I've always been like, man, like I, I've done this before uh, that I'm always afraid of hiring family members of other team members. And, uh, but I know Anna and I think she's a very, very talented person. And so she has recently joined our team and kind of did what most uh, team members have done sometimes is start off part time. And then literally a month later, or two months later, she's full time. And, <laughs> and here we go. So what's that like now? Uh, you're the CEO. She is working with our company. What dynamic has changed in, you, in your relationship? I, I think a couple things on that. So this goes back to you hiring me. It was not, that's probably not the best way to do that. And, but, you know, same thing with us. It, it was, that was probably not the, you know, there were a lot of things of like, Hey, I probably shouldn't hire my wife. We've always talked about, we should never work for the same company, not because we couldn't work together, but because like, what if something happens and mm -hmm. like, we're both out of a job, you know, all we've had these conversations before, like, no, let's not put ourselves in this situation. And this is exactly what happened. But what it comes down to is, is, is trust. Like that's, I, like I said, you kind of, you trusted me with a job, but you know, same thing with her is we, we sat down that bit in that meeting and really put up our accountability chart and our work chart and stuff like that. And, I was responsible for like 68%. I think it was 60% of 68% of the things that we do within our business. I was responsible for, I'm going to drop the ball. Like I, like I like to work. I'm a good worker and stuff like that, but I'm going to drop the ball somewhere along, along the line. And it was not allowing me to lead the business the way I needed to. And by, you know, going out and finding other opportunities and networking like I needed to. So like, it was something like, Hey, we came to the decision. like, Hey, Brian, you, you need an assistant. And, you know, and, so I just, I asked her, she was out of, she was not working at the time. We, she was getting ready to, she had taken a sabbatical from her job, was getting ready to start looking for another job. And basically that's when COVID hit and half of the HR world was pretty much let go and um, from their jobs and stuff like that. And really I came into it like, Hey, do you, would you, like she was the first person I thought of because I, I trust her to do that. And having that conversation, like, she, she definitely like took the weekend to think about it and stuff like that. It wasn't like, Oh yeah, I'll do this. Like you and I would have made this decision pretty quickly and stuff, I think. But um, no, so it was, but it was really easy to realize too right away of like, Hey, she's a lot more than an assistant. She's, which we knew that going into it and stuff like that, but she's, she's very high level. She's been into so many situations with employees and how to handle it and um, documentation that, you know, making sure things are, are correct and insurances and all that stuff. She's a very high level. Um, and she, she's a lot higher level than what we really need um, and things like that. But she's been a huge asset to our business um, as far as our relationship and stuff like that goes. Actually, I think it's been good. Like it hasn't, I'm waiting for that day of like, it's like, oh, like this is weird. Like this is like, we have like little moments here and there, but it's actually been a pretty good um, pretty good thing. And I think it's, I think it's been good for our marriage a little bit too. Um, I'll, I don't want to jinx that at all and stuff, but I feel like we have a pretty healthy marriage and I think being able to work together, I think just helps that out a little bit more. We, you know, we have something we have more to talk about and, you know, kind of, we're both, we both like to think we're both intellectuals. So we like to problem solve and, and think through that. There's been a couple moments where I was like, you know, maybe I maybe answered her a little quickly, um, you know, or kind of a little, maybe a little snippy. And I realized like, Oh, I like, that's not how I would have like talked to Ronnie in that situation. So I need to not talk to her like that and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so in that aspect, I've been become a lot more aware of how I, I speak to her about certain things, which is, which has been definitely good for our marriage and has helped, helped us out that way and things. But um, it's an interesting dynamic of, of, of working with your, with your spouse. But like I said, for us, it's, it's been good. Um, but I think it's just both because, you know, like I said, we're, you know, I feel like we're pretty high level too with what we do. So we're able to have some pretty good conversations and it's, it's, we're both helpers. So it's all about like kind of, Hey, taking this business to the next level and helping out where we can and stuff as well. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know she's a huge asset to the team too. And I love working with both of you guys. Um, so as, as we're kind of, you know, 
going into the end of the show here, there's just a few things I just want to kind of go over and cover. So uh, what what I see happen a lot to CEOs. So number one, I want to back up too. So we talked about an assistant. I think it's super important. If you're a CEO, you're watching this, I think you need an assistant. I think it's just crucial. Uh, there's a book that I read. Uh, I think it was by Michael Hyatt. It's called The World Class Executive Assistant, I believe. And uh, really, really helps you identify what an assistant can do. And I don't know if Anna is really like Brian's executive assistant. I don't think that's what we you know, have said or anything like that. But I just think it's important, whatever you, you call it, um, just to have yeah, some and, help. Yeah, and figuring out what that what that is. Like, I don't, I don't actually have an assistant. I have various people on the team that help me out with certain things. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have Anna that helps me out with kind of the operations and the paperwork side of things and, and does that. And that's not an assistant role at all. Um, but I, I know I have somebody that can take, kind of take care of that stuff and things. But then I also have like some, I use some of our virtual assistants for just different aspects of like, I probably shouldn't be, I, I enjoy it. And I love, you know, making things on Canva and editing videos and stuff like that, but I really should not be spending my time doing that. So mm -hmm. I'm going to use our, one of our virtual assistants. So it's really kind of figuring out like, what are the things that you're doing that you, shouldn't be doing there's things that i like doing that i'm good at doing but i really shouldn't be doing because i need to be focused on other things and having somebody that can even take care of that so if you don't have like a like hey this is my assistant and they're my you know gonna do you know what i need done and help me out with all those stuff like finding different people on your team maybe if they can take up some of those responsibilities helps out as well yeah exactly so Brian, uh, you've been really stepping up, not only in our organization, but other organizations have recognized it as well. Uh, recently, you were at the Sharper Business Solutions event in Orlando, Florida. You helped lead a room. Uh, so you've been stepping up in that organization with Gary Harper and their team. Uh, so what I see happen a lot to CEOs is they start gaining all these opportunities and they say yes to a lot of them. And then, uh, then they just have a lot of responsibilities more than they had before. So, you know, what, what's your advice on that? Um, is, you know, because if you look at our organization, we do a lot, right? We yeah. host a meetup, we're putting out content. We're, I think we flipped uh, 260 some deals last year. We're part of a mastermind group, a couple mastermind groups. You're helping lead, you know, segments of a mastermind group. And we can continue going down the list if you want, but what's yeah. your advice on, um, I guess my question is how does a CEO refresh and re-energize and not get so burned out? Yeah. So a couple things with that, it comes into of like, like we said kind of early in the show, if you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And that, that's a big thing. But all the stuff that we've kind of planned for that I'm doing and that we're doing, like it's, it's been deliberate. Like we've actually sat down in our leadership meetings and we've, as a leadership team, we've talked about like, Hey, all right, Brian, can we need to do this? Like, this is one of our goals, Brian, can you get involved in this or can you do this? So it's all been deliberate and stuff like that. And so I think that's a big thing um, behind that stuff. Um, but then just be, to be able to be refreshed, to be able to be you know, rejuvenate when you come off of those things is, for me, actually, it's, it's really tough because for me to do that, like, I love to travel. I love to, you know, explore new areas, um, whether it's, you know, in the U.S. or even outside the U.S. I love to travel, and we haven't really been able to do that. So, honestly, it's one of the things that I've, I've been struggling with. Like, I've just been talking to my, you know, with Anna, like, hey, you want to you go down to Florida for a few days or, like, for a week just to, like, get in the sunshine and, and do that? And, She's, she's not comfortable doing that because of COVID and, and things like that. I'm like, Hey, I, I can, I, you know, I respect that and stuff, but so at the same time, like I kind of need that a little bit. So it's been a little bit of a struggle for me, but it's just, it's, it's finding the little things that, that we can do. I'm like, all right, so let's, let's go for a car ride for this weekend. So we'll jump in and you know, head somewhere together or, you know, go out and check out a new restaurant together or, or get take out, you know, so doing like the little maybe travely things that I would, we would generally do, but we're doing them here locally and stuff. Um, and that's, that's my big escape and stuff. Um, but then too, it's just, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's figuring out what you need to, like, I, I always come back to like, because I love the analytics and like, I, I like to look at, like, I use the, the predictive index as a resource for this. I'm like, I'm a high B on the predictive, predictive index. And what, if you don't know the predictive index or anything like that, you don't, you don't need to, but what that means for me is I get energy from people. Mm -hmm. So for me to get energy from people. So I need to do little things. Maybe it's, maybe I just need to jump on a zoom call and like be around people or, you know, have a meeting with somebody because I need, I need to get energy from people. So lately, like my big thing has been, I've been just like driving around Indianapolis, number one, so I can check out neighborhoods. 
and see what's going on in the city. So I'm informing myself of that. But at the same time, too, I'm just having phone calls with a lot of people. So awesome. it's, it's one of the things I'm getting energy from the people because they're positive conversations. I'm able to help out where I can, which is another thing that I draw energy from. But I'm also able to check out our city and see kind of what's going on. So those things I've been doing lately to kind of escape from kind of the day to day stuff and sit behind a desk or something. Yeah, I think it's a lot of it is about self-awareness and you talked about the predictive index, just kind of knowing what does energize you. And I think a lot of people make the mistake if they don't dig in and like, I'm the same way. I think we're very alike. I get energy with people and if I'm cooped up and I'm feeling down about whatever I need to go out and have a meeting, like I had a, you know, met with my brother the other day and just had a lot of fun. And, uh, I just need a, a lot of that. Um, another one that I enjoy is called the Enneagram. And just, again, it's kind of about self-awareness, but my wife is the exact opposite. Honestly, she, she gets energy from being alone. So she dropped the kids off of school and she was at the house and just alone for like three for four hours. And she's like, man, I feel so energized because she was alone. So I think it's just about being self-aware about who you really are. Um, Brian, I want to talk about culture just a little bit. So you also love to do things and events and we've done some things as a team to try to build that culture. We've went down to Nashville, Tennessee. We've, um, you know, done some other trips. We've done the Florida trips. And one, one thing last year, uh, you did, or actually it was a year and a half or so ago was we did a Spartan race. And uh, said, <laughs> "Hey, let's do the Spartan race. Tell us, tell us about that real quick. Like, what, what was that all about, and uh, what happened on that?" Yeah, number one, I am just, I am old and out of shape. I know that. <laughs> so, um, no, but it's, um, you know, it's one of the things that I think is so important within teams. That not that everybody has to be best friends and get along, and because we've actually been on the, you know, Brett, within our business, we've been on the other side of that. We were almost too, too much of kind of too much culture and not enough like mm -hmm. into the business and stuff. So you have to have a balance between that, but you need to have, you need to have culture within your business and, and to be able to do things. So we try to do anything and everything that we can just kind of get some people to get together and, and do some stuff. And it's, it's tough, especially when we have um, things like COVID, you know, going on and things. So you want to make sure that everybody is safe and you know, that you don't, you know, you just, you want to protect people and, and, and stuff like that. So it is tough, but yeah, doing something like the Spartan race was a lot of fun of something that, you know, it was, it was kind of random, but like, Hey, let's do it. It was like the hottest day of the it was. year. It's like 105. Uh, it was like a hundred. Yeah. And like, it was, I was it like, was I hope crazy. it's and, funny. Cause I like, uh, had everybody sign a waiver if they died. <laughs> so yeah. like, if you die doing this, <laughs> I'm not liable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and something like that was so cool because that's the thing we are, we were all at different like athletic levels and there was, it was, it was really cool to see like, you know, like, I think I was the most out of shape out of the five of us that did it. And, but there were things that like, oh, like I was better at Brett than this. But yeah. then there's a, on the next thing, like, oh, I need help from Brett for this. And <laughs> so it was really kind of see, it was a really good team kind of building event. But then at the end too, we're always like, man, that was really tough. <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard. Yeah. <laughs> that was really hard. Awesome. Yeah. I think it's just so important to, to whatever it looks like to build that culture. And, and you're exactly right. We have, we've had times where it's been too much touchy feely. Let's have a small group kumbaya together. Uh, and I think you just need that balance. So have fun, but also have that accountability too, because business is tough. <laughs> you got to have yeah. people be accountable yeah. for sure. Yeah. And it's, you know, the, the toughest thing with all that of building a culture and having that within your team as a leader, as a CEO is like, there might be a time where you are, you get to, you get to be super close with somebody and then you have to let them go. Mm. Like that's always the big worry. That's always the big concern. I think a lot of leaders hold back from kind of building that culture and being a, they, they might have the culture within their business and maybe they're not a part of that culture uh, because they don't want to cross that line and stuff. And yeah, there is a line you have to keep there and things, but at the same time too, of like your team, I think it's a big for your team and, your leaders underneath you and then the people that are underneath them and who's ever on your team, they need to see you as human. They need to see that human side of you that, Oh, okay. Yeah. I can sit down and, you know, have a coffee with bread or, Oh, I can go, you know, drink a beer with this leader or, or Oh, they, Oh man, he's, man, he's, he's having trouble with his teenage daughter. Like it, they need to see that type of stuff and to kind of be like, not that yet, like you said, you said it really well, like you have to be all touchy feely and all that kind of stuff. But, I think it is really important that within your culture is where your people can, your, your team can see you as human as, you know, just another person too, that struggles each and every day because we all do. And when they uh, hit those points of whether they're struggling personally or they're struggling within the business, because there's going to be days when that can happen, 
they feel they're going to feel a lot more obliged to come to you and seek help and, you know, ask for help and things like that, which is really going to help your business out versus them being worried about saying something or worrying like that. And then all of a sudden it just continues to build and build. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So important. Uh, Brian, so you've been the CEO of Simple Wholesaling now for what, like nine months, Not something like that? Uh, since June 1st, nine, nine so, months, yeah, 2020. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So whenever, whenever you're watching this, date date this back, uh, this is coming out in, uh, uh, you know, 2021, uh, is there like kind of an aha moment that you've had, um, as a CEO, like last year where you're like, Oh my gosh, like, I don't know anything that just kind of comes to mind. Like, I can't believe we did this or this is crazy. What, what we're doing. And I can't believe I'm leading this I don't know. Is there any aha moments that stick out in your mind? <laughs> for for me, it was kind of like I was. I mean, I was really happy with our team last year and really proud of what they were able to accomplish and, and and stuff. And I'm kind of on the on the side of like, hey, I need to do a little bit better of celebrating those wins and putting them out there and stuff. And I'm always kind of a little bit pushing and you know for that next big thing. But I, I do talk about that. But like my big like kind of aha moment was about I think it was maybe like a month and a half or two months into being in this role where it hit me of like. I need to take better care of myself to be there for the team. If I have something happen, you know, if it's, you know, if I'm not taking care of my, of myself health wise, mentally wise. And it, it, that was the kind of the big thing with me. So um, if, if you know me, you may have heard me talk about this before, but something I've always struggled with and throughout my life is depression. Um, it's something that I've, it's always been there and, I've kind of always dealt with it and, and kind of just been okay with it. And I've been able to hide, you know, been able to hide that from a lot of people and kind of hide it within like how I operate and stuff like that too. But it was within this rule where it really hit me of like, Oh man, I need to, I need to address this. I need to take care of this. I need to number one, maybe even just talk about it. I've, I've talked to my, talked to the team about it just so they're aware of things, you know, so they, like it's, it's that not even that human side of things, but like, Oh man, if I, if, if something happens, like I want them to know kind of like, it's not really about them. You know, I'm just having a bad day and, something like that too but where it's like i need to make sure that i am healthy for my team because if i have a bad day or i have you know a couple bad days i'm like ah, that's not good like i need to make sure that i can help them out and support them and whatever they need and i don't want my issues to become part of a team issue or anything like that so mm. that was kind of a, like a big aha moment for me of like we're just like i need to, i need to make sure i take care of myself and every every way possible, you know, whether that's, you know, healthy, health wise, physical wise, mental wise, you know, spiritually, all that stuff. I need to make sure not that I'm, I'm not always going to be on top of my game, but I need to make sure I'm doing my best or setting myself up to make sure that whatever I'm doing today, I need to make sure that I'm going to be able to be, um, you know, in a good spot tomorrow for the team. Mm, exactly. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. Take care of yourself, put on your own oxygen mask before you can take care of other, other people. And there's so many just, um, similarities between teaching, CEO, parenting, we're all taking care of organizations, right? And, uh, and, and all of that, you have to take care of yourself before you can really give and pour energy into other people. So a couple questions, Brian, before we do our last section of the show, but, um, so what motivate, what motivates you, right? You talked earlier that you don't really care about real estate. It's not like you wake up and man, you want to buy a house cause it, that's awesome. Um, I think whenever we first met, you talked about money and I don't know if money is your total motivator. So what, what motivates yeah. you? Um, I, I think it really just comes from helping. I want to help other people. And really my thing is now is that I just want to, I just want to elevate people to whatever they, whatever position they, they want to be in. Um, so, you know, with you meeting you is, it was kind of one of those things of you were, I remember we did our, you know, our one page plan and like your the big, hairy, audacious goal that we had for our company, which is just like a 30 year goal was Brett just wanted a self-sustaining company that he didn't have to do, like, he didn't have to like really be involved in. Right. And it's like, and I wake right, up one day and we check that three out. Three years in, check, like it's done. <laughs> it's like one of those things. So that, but that was my goal with you of like, Hey, I want to, I want to help you. Like, I want to elevate you to this, to get you to that, to that point or do anything I could to help you get there. And, and I didn't know that this, like this was my path with that or anything, but I was going to do whatever I could. And it's the same thing with like the team right now of, Hey, I want to make sure that I, you know, I'm elevating them to whatever level they, they want to be at that they're comfortable with their life and, and um, you know, professionally and personally and things like that. And then, and too, is just coming into, you know, making sure that, you know, my wife and I can take care of our families. Like we have like family stuff going on right now and it's, 
it's tough because my parents live in Ohio, her parents live in Massachusetts and we're kind of away from them, but they're that age of like, man, there's just there's be little things that pop up here and there and that they need help with. And we can't always be, but can we, what can we do? And can we at least help out anyway? Can we at least be, you know, healthy ourselves and, you know, financially stable ourselves so we can help out where we can and stuff. So um, that's a big thing. It's not like a great answer of like, Oh, I'm going to go, you know, where, I'm you know, around involved with Eddie Wilson doing a couple of things. I hear stories of him doing all these huge big things like national area, like, you know, across the world and, you know, putting up these Christian radio stations and building water wells and all this. Like, I wish I could say like, man, I need, I'm, I, I need a purpose like that. I need a goal like that. And I, I think eventually like I'll get there, but right now it's just about like, I need to make sure that I'm taking care of myself and I'm, that I'm healthy, but then also that I'm able to do whatever I can to help elevate everybody around me. And if it's, even outside of our team, if there's anybody that I'm involved with, that's what I want to do is just help them help elevate them to whatever that next level is and stuff. And it's one of the things that I, I don't think like in throughout my life, I never really had that person that was pushing me to do that. There were different coaches and that want the best for me, like on the court and um, you know, or on the field and things like that. But it's one of those things of like being pushed to like kind of be your best, the best version of yourself. That's something I, I maybe missed through my life because things did come a little bit easy to me um, um, that I never, I never learned, I never learned how to like kind of push myself as much as I, as much as I, I wish I would have mm-hmm. um, and not push is maybe the wrong word with that and stuff. But like, that's, uh, that's what I really want to work to do is like help elevate anybody to kind of reach to under, understand maybe what their potential is and help them get there if I can be. Love it. Love it. And I think we just go, go through different seasons and everybody has their own season and their own purpose. I mean, I'm in this season right now where I have a lot of personal things going on too. And I want to do, I have aspirations to do bigger things, maybe just to speak, to travel, to do missions trips, but I'm in a certain season that, Hey, this is just where God has me at. You're in a season right now. And, and Eddie Wilson might be in a, in a different season, right? So I think yeah. whoever's listening to this just needs to realize, Hey, where am I at right now? Self-aware and um, what season am I in? And just, yeah, again, I think, I, I think a lot of people get kind of trapped in that, you know, the whole Grant Cardone thing and, you know, this, the uh, you know, the Gary Vee stuff of like you being this huge thing and 10 exit and all this stuff of like, sometimes maybe I'm not, like some people aren't ready for that yet. I need to figure out like, I need to one exit or two exit first and then like, oh, okay, it's stable. And then now I can go with it. Now I need to figure out what my path is and then I can tackle it that way and stuff. So. Yeah. And some people just aren't uh, wired or driven to, to 10X. I mean, I don't have enough, I don't think I have enough drive to, to do that. There's not enough, if I 10X my money, for example, there's not enough drive. I'm not driven enough to do that. You know, maybe I'm driven enough to two exit, but I just think that everybody's wired a little bit different. So, so just be you. I think you said it really, really well, just be the best version of yourself. And, uh, and that's all that we can do. So Brian, um, you know, we're going to go into the last section of the show, but before, before we do that, I want to just ask you any advice that you just want to kind of give our listening audience out there as we, uh, kind of wrap up here and any, um, you know, you see mistakes that people are making or other CEOs. I know you're surrounded by a lot of, a lot of business owners. Yeah. I think, uh, it comes back to actually, we just talked about a little bit ago, with the kind of the culture thing of having that balance between culture and professionalism and business of, um, kind of coming off of the sharper event last week, I was around, um, you know, a bunch of different leaders and a bunch of high level leaders and uh, people that make kind of make our business look small and, and stuff like that. But like, one of the things that I saw was like, it, they were either on that end of either they were struggling with, Oh, we, you know, I really like the people I work with and stuff like that, but I just need a little bit more. I need to be more business. Like I need to be more professional. I need to like kind of grow this and have my processes around it and stuff like that. Or they're on the opposite end of, man, we have a great business and we're doing well, but this department fights with this department and, and stuff like that. So it comes down to really understanding from that, from you as a leader of, Hey, this is, this is who I am. This is who we are. And we, we're going to be, we're going to tighten this up over here, but that also we're going to have some fun while we do it. Of uh, being able to balance that. If you, if you are able to do that, you're going to be so successful as a leader. And that's really what it comes down to. Uh, being able to be that that professional side and be that business like side and be able to have those goals and reach those, but then also enjoy doing it while you're doing it in those moments. Like that's that's just amazing. And that meshing those two things together is is one of the best things that anybody can do. 
Love it, love it. Well, thanks, man, for opening up on on today's show. Uh, I know we just kind of dug into Brian Snyder's life and the journey that you've been on. You've been such a an inspiration to so many, not only to myself but to our team and to so many others. And I know you're going to continue stepping up. And really, 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 really appreciate it, man. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks um, for having me. I think I feel I feel like I should have maybe been laying down on a you know a couch. Yeah, I'm like like the counselor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm the therapist. I, I, I do have one. I, one thing did come to my mind, Brett, before we jump out of here and do the interview stuff. I I, I saw you asked me earlier of like what you know what you could expect if you were in my in my classroom and stuff like this. Yeah. Something that I can say that you would have 100 percent have a feeling hated is I was never I never once in my teaching career said hey we're gonna put in a video and watch a video today. <laughs> So I feel like you. Lo- I right. feel like you were the kid that I would have loved those that. teachers. And that, I was. So. That was. Um, <laughs> that was. I was like, I. This stinks. I'm. I'm just putting in a video. I'm not prepared at all. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Well, Brian, uh, we're gonna do something fun as we wrap up the show here, and. Um, I like to do fun things and, and hopefully the listening audience really, really enjoys this. So one thing that I never really got to do was to interview you, right? We sat down for breakfast one time, didn't really do an interview, never interviewed for really any of the other positions that you've had. And, and even as a CEO, I just said, Hey, Brian, why don't you be the CEO? I didn't really ask any <laughs> questions on it. So I'm going to do a fake interview. So, hey, everybody out there, this is a fake interview, so uh, there's no legal things that, you know, nothing, none of this is going to be held against us in the court of law, right? So, this isn't a real interview, and so if I ask any questions or Brian responds in any certain way that isn't, you know, totally interview style, corporation, politically correct, uh, sorry for that. So, <laughs> so, I just want to make sure you, you can't unhire me if I'm not That's qualified right. for <laughs> So, uh, so here we go. This is the fake interview with Brian Snyder. So, Brian, come in to my office and, uh, hey, uh, what's going on? Have a seat. Uh, welcome to the Simple Wholesaling Company. Uh, my name is Brian Snyder, and uh, so thanks for coming in here. What's your name? Well, you're Brett Snyder. So I'm Brian Snyder, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just messing with you, man. Just met. we like right. to have fun yeah. here at Simple Wholesaling. Just. <laughs> So, just mess with you. No, everything's well. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for the opportunity to you know interview with your company. Um, I you know really appreciate the opportunity. It's great to meet, get to meet you, and uh, learn more about what you guys do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, uh, Brian, uh, I hear that you were a math teacher, right? Ma- you did math. Is that? Yeah, that I taught. You? I taught math for fourteen years. Okay. Uh, so, were you were you any good at math? Are you good? We we make a lot of money here, so. You need to be really good at math. Yeah, I, lo- I love the analytical side of things. I love understanding kind of the numbers behind it, the way they work, what they do, um, and then really using the numbers to make decisions um, within our business. And, you know, the same thing I did within my classroom. Of I wanted to be able to use the data to make the decisions of what I was going to te- teach next and who, what level the students were at and things. So being able to do that, I want to bring that into this business as well, use the data and the analytics and the numbers to drive our decision making. And then also side, I would have a binder of like all the, the analytics and how great of a teacher I was and share the numbers behind it. So <laughs> this is where I would maybe hand it. Do you want to take a look at this, Mr. Snodgrass? Okay. All to- right. Well, all I want to know is if you're good at math. So all I have a quick, I'm going to test you. What is <laughs> six, div- what's 24 divided by six? 24 divided by six is four. Okay. Very good. You are good at math. <laughs> all right. Number one. All right. Number three here. So you were born in Ohio, right? It's the, the sunshine state. Yep. Roll tide. So what's it like being from a state that stinks? Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the Buckeye state is an amazing state, but I'm excited to be here in Indianapolis and the Hoosier state as well to help my development and help me be able to grow and hopefully be allow me to become more of a well-rounded person. Awesome. And if you don't want to comment on some of these other ones, that's, that's fine too. So, <laughs> all right. So Brian, um, you know, are, are, are you married? Is, do you have a wife? Is that, how I would you married. describe a wife? How would you Anna, describe yourself as a, years. how would you describe yourself as a husband between one and eight? Give yourself a number one and eight. Describe yourself. 
one being a bad husband and eight being a, hot, a great husband. One being like you wear a uh, wife beater around with stains on it and you eat chili dogs and don't take care of your wife and eight, um, you're writing post-it notes on her mirror and reading books to her at night and giving her massages. Steaming, steaming up the mirror and putting a heart on there. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite Brett, Brett Snogger at level of that. So I'll give, my, I'll give, give myself a 6.5. 6.5. All right. Sounds good. All right, Brian. So how much money is in your bank account right now, today? Well, if you if you bring me on your team, it'll be a lot more for both of us, Brett. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. All right, Brian. So if I'm having a problem with my wife, like how would you solve it? How do you help? Um, <laughs> professionally, I would just say, I would, I would, if you need somebody to talk to, um, I'd be more than happy to, to listen to you and help you out in any way, but okay, I would, I, need I would help. rather not get involved in your, I would very, I would not like to get involved in your marital issues if, <laughs> if possible. Is that one of the job requirements on this? I, I need, a, the, lo uh, I need a lot of help and I don't have a counselor, so I do need help with that, but, um, but I'll take that into account. Um, I just have a few more questions for you before we, you know, end this interview. But who do you really hate? Like, who's someone? Um, no I, I try to see the good in everyone. Okay. All right. Because all right. So, all right. Uh, do you like the maybe, smell? Maybe of, Wolverine fan. Wolverine. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Do you like the? Do you enjoy the smell of money? Like, like when you just love the smell of it. You walk in and you're like, man, I smell money. Do you like that? not one of my favorite smells, but I, I, don't, I don't mind the smell of money. Okay. All right. Uh, if you had one week to live, would you accept this job? Yes. Probably not. I don't want to put you, I don't want to put you out in any way. So I probably would not accept this job if I had one week to live. I'd probably live the, do everything I wanted to. Well, if you had one week to live, we wouldn't hire you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just joking. All right. Uh, all right. What was your favorite nineties show? Favorite TV nineties. Hey by the bell by far. One mm. of the best shows ever made. Hey preppy. All right. I knew that. Uh, if we played a game of chess, who would win? Um, I'm going to say probably me. Mm. Checkmate. All right. <laughs> if you have a disgruntled employee, uh, that came in and they said, man, like, I can't do anything right. My life is terrible. Go. I would uh, clear my schedule and find some time to sit down with them and talk to them and figure out what was going on, figure out what was at the root of their, of their trouble and, uh, and then do, do my best to build them back up and tell them all the positive things that they, that they have been doing. Okay. Sounds good. Last question, and this is the big one. Do you think that you are a fit for our company? Do you think you would make us better? I think I would make you better. I would teach you how to interview people a little bit better. I have better <laughs> questions. So I can maybe help you out with that. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. That's the you're hired, man. CEO, Simple Wholesaling, hired. Thank you so much for playing that game. Uh, <laughs> anyways, this is a wrap with Brian Snyder. Brian, man, it has been awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, one last just question. If someone wants to reach out to you, where, what's the best place? We get a lot of questions about people interested in wholesaling in general, coming to our meetup. Um, what, what should they do? Yeah, bet, uh, a couple different things. So definitely hit up um, our website. So simplewholesaling.com is a great way or a great place to go to to uh, find out information, share our vlogs, all that stuff. Also join the Facebook group, um, Wholesaling Made Simple um, on there or reach out to me anytime. Um, you, you hit me up on social media, just Brian Snyder. Um, and uh, on Instagram, I'm the Indy Snyder on there. Um, and you can reach out to me also just on email. It's brian at simplewholesaling.com. So more than happy to uh, feel free to reach out um, if you need help with anything at all. More than happy to help you out. Definitely. And uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this or we mentioned this in the show, but we also have another podcast called the Indie Investor Podcast. So check that out if you're investing in Indianapolis. Very great show. We get so much great feedback uh, from that show. Yeah. Brian has that up. So thank you so much, that's Brian. Actually, I think that's one of my favorite things that we do. So that's, that's a pretty yeah. cool little project that we got going on. And it's a great way to learn about the city of Indianapolis. So yeah. Definitely. That's a wrap. This is with Brian Snyder. Thank you so much, Brian. God bless you, man. Thanks, brother.
Thank you so much for checking out the Brett Snodgrass channel. If you like this video, please slam on that like button. And if you really like it, then subscribe to our channel here. And remember to leave us a comment below, and I'm going to try my hardest to reply to all the comments. Thank you guys so much. This is why I do what I do. Every single week, I come out with content that focuses on success, freedom, and living out your purpose. Thank you guys so much. See you next time.